remember the question was, uh, are we talking about the materials, like plants themselves, or are we talking about the air? These, these directional arrows are highlighting what happens to air when the process of photosynthesis or the process of respiration by a whole ecosystem occur. When photosynthesis is occurring, it takes CO2 out of the atmosphere and it leaves the atmosphere less negative. Okay, when respiration is occurring, it adds CO2 to the atmosphere and it, because of this, and it, it's adding relatively negative CO2 to the atmosphere because it's organic material, so this depletes the atmosphere. And you can see this when you make measurements. So these are measurements that come from that tunable diode laser that I mentioned at the start. And these are averages over a whole summer, I think, um, three month. So this is the same kind of thing, midnight to midnight on the time axis here. And the top pattern is just like the one I showed you from the forest with the, the little diamond tree diagram on it. This is the highest inlet on our tower, 21 and a half meters. And this is the lowest inlet, and these go in order. And so at night, there's buildup of respiratory CO2. And in the morning, there's a decrease. And that decrease is caused by the action of the atmosphere, not by photosynthesis. The highest buildup occurs closest to the ground. And it goes in order with height, Okay, when you average for long enough. This is what the pattern of C13 of CO2, of atmospheric CO2 in this forest looks like. When respiratory CO2 is building up with a stable atmosphere, it's depleting the CO2 in the forest, okay? So the forest CO2 close to the ground, is, it's not minus eight, it's minus 10 and a half on average. So is this why you see differences in the, um, in the carbon isotopes between these things and these things in the bottom versus the top of the tree? Or is that due to processes within the tree itself? This is due to the stability of the atmosphere and the fact that most of the respiratory CO2 is coming out of the ground. But I mean, like, so is, is what we see, because we, we know that there's, we dig it from the top of the tree versus from the bottom of the tree. There's, like, a slightly different... Yes, there is, that. but, uh, so, uh, this is a good point. So, uh, you must have learned that from Jim. Uh, the yeah. sun leaves and shade leaves are different in their isotopic composition. And they're different because of a variety of things. It's a physiology difference, but because they're in different light environments, the allocation of nitrogen is different, the amount of rubisco is different, the discrimination is different. There's probably a water relations aspect to that as well. So this means that the products of photosynthesis from shade leaves or from sun leaves are different. However, most of the photosynthesis occurs in sun leaves. And if you look at a flux weighted average of the whole operation, that's what's making its way through the phloem down to the roots. And that's the, the stuff that, the live stuff that organisms are op operating on within the the ground. And so the root respiration is a big component of soil respiration. There's lots of organisms that feed on the live carbon that's in those roots. But then the leaves that differ in their isotope composition, okay, uh, sun leaves versus shade leaves, those fall off the plant and those get decomposed too, right? So regardless of that, the net effect of photosynthesis and respiration is really obvious here. And mainly what we're looking at is the effect of respiration. You can see in this forest, there actually is still a CO2 gradient of about 10 ppm during the day, and there's an isotope ratio gradient of about half a per mil that goes along with that. I told you that this decrease in CO2 or this increase here is not caused by photosynthesis, but by atmospheric mixing. These, I don't know if you can see the color difference. This is the top of the tower. These gray ones are all within the vegetation canopy and these black ones are all within two meters of the ground. And so the ones that are in the vegetation canopy are the ones that are most likely to have a photosynthetic signal associated with them. And if you look here, early in the morning, the vegetation canopy becomes more enriched and lower in CO2 than the top of the tower. That's early in the morning, the atmosphere has not yet begun to really mix, but the sun's up and photosynthet photosynthesis is occurring photosynthetic discrimination is occurring. And you can see this brief photosynthetic enrichment and lower CO2, and then the atmosphere washes it all away, okay? So there's just a hint of the photosynthetic signal there. It's much harder to study photosynthesis from these flux towers than it is to study respiration because of the size of the box. 
the nighttime box is a smaller box, and you get bigger isotopic signals to work with. Does that make sense? Um, do you mind going back to the slide? Just one? Uh, yeah. So are you saying that the, the net effect of this is zero when you consider like atmosphere interaction? Well, it's not. This is the disequilibrium, the land disequilibrium that we talked about before. These actually are subtly different, less than half a per mil in terms of their net effect. And when you're looking at the global carbon cycle, because the fluxes are so big compared to the other fluxes of the carbon cycle, these impart an isotopic, sig isotopic signature on the atmosphere that, are, that is an important one, and you have to pay attention to those differences. Okay. So you're saying the net biosphere atmosphere effect of these fractionations is not significant? Yeah, the little ones, uh, in going from, say, sugars that are made by photosynthesis to a lipid, there's an isotopic change. But if something eats a photosynthetic sugar or a lipid and then burps out CO2, it still is really negative in its isotope composition. So uh, if I back up a few slides there, let's look at those differences. So here's uh, sugar. Sugars are, let's say, the anomaly is plus one and a half, and lipids are four. So there's a five per mil difference there between those. But the difference in the atmosphere and what respiration is adding to it is, you know, minus eight compared to minus 28, and it's a much bigger signal there. Well, they are important, and in my full morning lecture that I, I normally give in this class, I go into some detail about those things. We do have to pay attention to them for some aspects of, of what we're trying to learn, and there are some real elaborate experiments that have gone on where people take a whole tree that's 10 meters tall, and they put it all in a big bag, and they give it a big slug of labeled C1302, and then you can watch that label move through everything. And when you hit it with a big hammer like that, you can ignore most of these little fractionations. And you can look at the timing of allocation and things like this. So it, always, it all depends on the question. If what you're trying to do is use mass conservation to sort out the global carbon cycle and ocean versus land sinks, you can ignore all these things. If you want to understand how plants interact with fungi that live and eat their roots, then you have to pay attention to these details. Okay, 15 minutes to go, and I do have time to cover the mixing lines. So isotopic mixing, you, you got a sense for this from most of the lectures already. Isotopes can help us quantify things, but it, it is often how much of this versus how much of that, right? So if you take a C3 leaf and a C4 leaf and you put them in a box and you measure the isotopic change over time as they respire into that box, you get a certain signature. And if you know what the signature that comes from the C3 leaf and the C4 leaf is, then you can sort out a partitioning that gives you the amount of CO2 that comes from either, right? You can sort out the fluxes, et cetera. This is all just the idea of <coughs> linear superposition. And so the, the concept of a Keeling plot is derived also from conservation of mass. And here I'm Describing this uh, with the first equation, this is conservation of mass for total CO2. There's some measured amount Cm, and that is the composition. That's, that measured amount is the combination of some source A and some source B. So an example for this, imagine there's a starting point. This room was empty when we showed up at 8.30. People come in, and they start to breathe. So the empty room is the initial starting point, Ca. We come in. And imagine we all had exactly the same thing for breakfast, and we have exactly the same physiology. And so we all breathe out with exactly the same isotope ratio. C, well, we'll get to the isotope ratio in a bit. But we breathe a certain amount, Cb, and the CO2 in this room will change. It was what it was to begin with. It builds up because we're in here. I'm ignoring the fact that there's a ventilation system. Okay, This simple equation is just a combination of two things. All right, so you add A and B, and you get M in this case, and you can measure that. And in fact, we've done this in this forum before where we are collecting flasks during class, and ultimately we, we can collect the, the average isotopic signature of our respiration from doing that. So mass balance for total CO2. I've written the same equation here for the light and the heavy isotope, so we could write a mass balance equation for either one. And this mathematical expression is an identity. So C13, 
the amount of C13 is equal to that ratio times the amount of 12. That's just a mathematical identity. The total amount of 12 uh, can be approximated by the total amount of CO2. We just measure all the CO2 that's there, the C12, the C13, the radioactive bits, the doubly labeled, everything. So there's an approximation of going from this to this, but really this is an isotope ratio times the total amount, okay? If we put the absolute amounts in here, we can ignore radioactive and clumped, et cetera, because they're tiny compared to the others. So we're really just dealing with a natural abundance of C12 and C13. And this is pretty close to exact, okay? This C13, we're approximating with this R times C, and there's an error of about 1% in doing this approximation, okay? If you take that approximation, and you put it into that equation, we can estimate C13 measured by a ratio, an isotope ratio, times the total CO2 that's measured. And you can push that through the delta equation and just turn it into this. Okay, so there is an approximation in using this equation. This is something like the mass balance for the heavy isotope. In this case, the C13 isotope of CO2. And so these two blue equations are the equations that are used in a two in-member mixing model called a Keeling plot. Questions about that? Each of the terms has an error of about 1%, but they all go together. And so this, when you have a system that has a major isotope and a minor isotope, and you don't have a bunch of others, this works well. This wouldn't work for something like sulfur, or where you have a, a variety of isotopes. Um, the C term, you said that's the measured amount. Is, should that be, like, can that be a concentration, or does it mean? It is, I'm sorry. Yeah, the C's here refer to concentration. So let me, let me take you through the room analogy again. We, if we came in here and we measured the concentration of CO2 in here when we got here, that would be CA. And then periodically, every 10 minutes, we measure the concentration in the room that's CM, okay, which began where when we started CA and CM were the same, and then we breathe into the room. And so CB is continually adding to the system, and the more CB we add by breathing out, the higher CM gets. So over time, we capture a change in CM, and we're gonna combine that change in CM with a change in the measured delta M in the room, so the only measured quantities here are CM and delta M, but with these two equations, we can back out the signature of what we've added in the room. So this is the approximation that gets us to the blue, second blue equation. When you combine these two equations, these are the blue ones from the last slide, and you rearrange, we've got a delta, and we're plotting that versus one over CM. So this is measured, that's measured, this is not measured, but this is a slope term, and this is an intercept term. I've set this up so that we can solve for an intercept in a line that gives us delta B, okay? Delta A was the starting point, the carbon isotope ratio of CO2 in the room when we started. Delta M is the changing, every 10 minutes we measure it, isotope ratio in the room over time as we breathe into it. Delta B is the collective signature of our breath in this room. Okay, so here's where that assumption about if we all ate the same breakfast and we all have the same physiology, then we're all breathing out the same thing. But if you had cornflakes for breakfast or you had spinach for breakfast, you're breathing out a very different signature. Have you guys been doing breath experiments? Usually we do. I don't think I was doing this. We, if you eat a candy bar, some target individual in the class eats a candy bar and then you watch their, their breath over time, you can actually see the C4 sugars go through their metabolism. It's a really clean, obvious experiment. Okay, you with me on this? We can make a plot of delta versus one over C, delta M versus one over CM. And from that we can extract an intercept and that intercept tells us about the isotope ratio of the CO2 that was added. Uh, I'll come back to these assumptions in a sec. So here's an example. Uh, this is a real example, real, real data that comes from this paper uh, by Diane uh, Pataki in 2003. 
So carbonized topration of CO2 and the inverse of the measured, uh, this is 1 over CM in the notation that I've given you. The white dots are actual measurements. And this ultimately plots as a straight line. Okay, We've got two sources. This was a forest probably. These were measurements made in a forest at night when there's no photosynthesis going on. By looking at the change in CO2 and the change in the carbon isotope ratio, you can put a regression through this line. And that regression gives you the signature of respiration from the whole forest. That's a Keeley plot. Okay, So uh, I think some of you might be doing soil respiration experiments. Tell me about your experiment. What do you have going? Uh, we've got some incubations going where we added C4 sugar to, to soils. OK. So, uh, and probably some don't have C4 sugar and some do. That's the idea. OK. So if you've got an incubation with a soil in a jar and you add something to it, like a C4 sugar, and there's microbes in there, if those microbes eat that C4 sugar, they're going to spit out C4-like CO2. We're feeding them candy bars, basically. Yes. And the other ones, if you're feeding a C3 sugar, or maybe you're just giving them water or something, the other ones aren't going to have that C4 signature. And so if you look at concentration and isotope ratio change in the headspace of that vial over time, it should give you a signature, an intercept, that reflects the flux weighted isotope ratio of all the sources of respiration in your jar. And one would expect those two to be different. Are they? Do you have your results yet? Um, we're seeing some difference. We sampled two of the soils. We're seeing a difference in our soils and other grass soils. When I've done this experiment before with the students in this class, uh, it can often be hard with soils to see that priming thing. If we do it with yeast, then we get a really big signal because the yeast you basically just have sugar in solution and a bunch of yeast. Um, what's that? So that's like cheating. <laughs> well, it's not cheating. It, it, you, you, learn, you learn techniques from that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. And so uh, a, a great example of the way this, this kind of stuff gets used in, in real forest ecology, for example, you can take labeled litter. Okay? You can grow plants with a weird isotope ratio for their leaves. And you can throw that down on the ground, and you can watch the isotope ratio of what comes off. And that tells you about the decomposition time, the residence time of the new carbon that you've added. And so this is really useful in trying to understand decomposition. Sort of a methodological question, but how do you gauge like, when you should take those measurements? Like, what's the best situation for that? I don't know if that makes sense, but like. Depends on the experiment and the goals of the experiment. Well, so in the example that I just provided, um, if you want to look at how spinach leaves get consumed, or you want to look at how a piece of red wood gets consumed, you know, the time scale of when you would make measurements is really different there, based on some just general understanding of how fast spinach decomposes versus a big chunk of wood. Right? So that's a radical example. But spinach leaves versus pine needles are going to have a different decomposition time as well. OK, so there are some assumptions uh, here. These are on the slide prior. Um, the assumption is that the starting point is unchanging. So CA and delta A. And the isotope composition of what's being added, in this case, CB, so this is our collective isotope ratio of, of breath, that's also unchanging. Um, and there's none of this stuff, OK? No diffusion. So diffusion actually alters this a lot. If you're trying to look within the soil system as opposed to the headspace of a vial, diffusion actually is a really important thing that you have to sort out. And I've got some papers that explain all this if you're, if you're curious about that. Uh, no reactions are allowed. That equation is basically just adding a couple of things. And so if you had, say, the oxygen isotope ratio of CO2 in a soil system, then you'd have to deal with water CO2 oxygen isotope exchange as well. And this equation, the simple equation I gave you there, doesn't include that. So that's not allowed when using this Keeling plot. Only two sources, or if there's an additional source, then the relative proportions are unchanging. And I'll give you an example of that with water here. So this Keeling plot is not only applied to CO2. This is just linear mixing 
of two things that are different in their isotopic composition. And so here's an example, the hydrogen or, or O18 composition of water plotted as 1 over Cm, the measured amount of water vapor in the air, absolute humidity. And if you've got some source here and you've got, uh, sorry, some uh, starting point, this is the Ca and delta A in the, the room example that I gave you. If you've got a transpiration flux and an evaporation flux that differ in their isotopic composition, but you can define what those isotopic compositions are, then a mixing line would tell you about how much evaporation is there or how much transpiration is there in a system like that. So Dave Williams did not come this year, uh, unfortunately, but he would have shown these kind of keeling plots using water vapor. So this is, this is a way to understand the water fluxes in, a, in an ecosystem. Okay, I'm not going to cover the last couple of slides here. Uh, this is a variation. I'll just give you an a introduction to it. These are the same two equations rearranged in a different way. And the real advantage to this is that you can allow uh, the starting point to vary. And if you go and you read the papers that are cited here, um, this is the seasonal cycle of atmospheric CO2 and C13. And they're looking at that varying signal, the smooth lines through there, as the background. And then they're looking at local deviation from that background. And they can discern things about seasonality of discrimination from this. So it's a variation. It's a mixing line variation that allows for variability. The analogy to our room example would be, we started with CA and delta A in our room here. And if that was changing somehow, there's a big fan pumping in a different signal over time, then we would have to account for that as well. And we can account for that if we know what it is. So it, uh, an important uh, feature here is that these don't have to be additions. It's easier to understand this. We got a starting point and then we add to it. But if we were all plants and there was a sun in here and we all walked in and we started to photosynthesize, okay, we would have some starting CA and then we could take CO2 out of the atmosphere, right? And so if you put a leaf in a box and you give it light, CO2 decreases, you can back out the net signature of photosynthesis this way, right? So the, sign, the sign of these can be plus or minus. Okay, my hour and a half is up, and so now it's time for a break. Happy to answer any questions you got. Sorry about the notes. <laughs>